it's uh, we're a little bit ahead of schedule today, which is terrific. That'll give uh, Dr. Nab a little bit, a few more minutes to show some cool stuff. Uh, what I'd like to do is show you outside one more time here this morning from Breckenridge live. The clouds are really breaking up, so uh, Dale, your forecast is verifying um, uh, already. Agreeing, it's very nice, very nice out there. So. Our next speaker is Dr. Uh, Rick Nabb, who is the director of the National Hurricane Center. And his uh, career in tropical weather forecasting has spanned both the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, from forecaster to risk assessment to on-air hurricane expert at the Weather Channel. Rick returned to the NOAA's National Hurricane Center as director, where he experienced what, what may be marked as the biggest challenge of his career, Superstorm Sandy. Rick joins us for the second year in a row to focus our discussions here at the Weather and Climate Summit on hurricane hazards, how the National Hurricane Center will change products and warnings to better respond to these evolving impacts, but before the storm hits, we must prepare. So take a look at this brief video produced by the National Hurricane Center that gives you a little introduction to the Hurricane Center itself, and then we'll move on with Rick's presentation. So let's take a look. I'm James Franklin, Branch Chief of the Hurricane Specialist Unit at NOAA's National Hurricane Center in Miami. The Atlantic hurricane season runs from June 1st through November 30th. Every coastal community from Atlantic Canada through the U.S. East and Gulf Coasts, Latin America and across the Caribbean is vulnerable to these massive storms. Hurricane hazards include high winds, heavy rains, storm surge, inland flooding and tornadoes and recent storms such as Sandy, Irene, and Ike have had a deadly impact. You've probably heard NOAA's seasonal outlook, forecasting how many named storms, hurricanes, and major hurricanes will occur over the entire season. But please don't use the seasonal forecast to decide if or how you should prepare. These outlooks can't forecast where a storm will make landfall, and it only takes one storm hitting your community to make it a bad year for you. Forecasters at NOAA's National Hurricane Center continuously monitor the tropics for signs of a developing storm, forecasting the storm track and intensity, and then issuing timely watches and warnings as the storm approaches land. But you have to do your part. Be prepared this hurricane season. For more information, visit our website at hurricanes.gov. Well, good morning, everyone. It is really good to be back in Breckenridge. It is really uh, an honor to talk to all of our media partners here today. You are so vital to what we do in the National Weather Service, and a couple of our uh, Weather Service colleagues have already spoken to you this week are still in the room. So it's always good to partner together to talk, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Uh, having worked in the media myself, I really respect what you all do. And it is so difficult. It's so much more difficult than folks realize uh, all the preparation that goes into what goes on in the air. And we are uh, thrilled to be partnering with you on an ongoing basis. And as, as much as I love weather, especially tropical, I love technology. And it's really uh, pretty cool that the technology allows us to talk to all of you out there uh, listening to the live stream. And hopefully we'll get some really uh, interesting questions from you via social media. And I'm looking forward to answering those as well. Uh, so this is kind of an update. Uh, you know, as you know, the 2013 Atlantic hurricane season was not very impactful for the United States and overall was not all that busy compared to past years and, and averages. Uh, there were some impacts which we'll briefly talk about. Uh, so what I'm going to mostly talk about today is the future and where we are headed with enhancing our collection of products and services and warnings and some of the key messages that, that we're trying to emphasize as we try to get everyone uh, prepared for the next hurricane, and not just domestically, but internationally as well. So we're going to focus on the hazards and talk about the upcoming changes to our products and our warnings. But before we get to all that, let's go ahead and knock out the seasonal forecast issue and, and talk about how last season uh, went and how it didn't go. Uh, this is the track map, a preliminary one, because our hurricane specialists are just getting to the point where they're finishing up their analyses of every individual cyclone that occurred in both the Atlantic and Eastern Pacific. That's part of what they do in the latter part of the hurricane season during the off season. And so uh, depending on how things are finalized, uh, this track map might slightly change, but this is a pretty good depiction of what happened during the year. Uh, certainly is 
below average to have two hurricanes during the whole season and no hurricanes reach major hurricane status, category three or stronger on the Saffir Simpson hurricane wind scale. We did have one impact in the United States with Andrea uh, very early in the season, in the first week of June. And that storm was interesting for a couple of reasons. Um, one of which was that it had some relationship to the changes we made following Sandy. As you recall, when we talked last year, and in many other venues, as you recall, uh, we made two significant changes on June 1 of last year that came directly out of Sandy. Number one was that we now at the Hurricane Center had the ability to continue issuing forecasts and advisories, even if a system becomes post-tropical. Okay? And we in the Weather Service uh, gained the ability on June 1 to issue or maintain tropical storm or hurricane watches or warnings, even if a system is post-tropical. And of course, we thought, well, Sandy was a very unusual case. Uh, I strongly advocated within our agency to make those changes, and, and we did. Uh, we didn't think we'd have to use it very often. And five days, six days after we implemented the new policy, we used it. <laughs> as, as Andrea went up the east coast of the United States, certainly nowhere near the impacts of Sandy. But it went through that transition of becoming a post-tropical cyclone, and despite that, we continued to issue our advisories, and we did, in the Weather Service, uh, maintain some tropical storm watches and warnings uh, despite its change in status. So that change, I think, works, and it was vetted and thought through and tested in the off-season, and it worked. So uh, that's, that's a bit of good news there. Uh, the, the bad news with Andrea is that it didn't have zero impact. There was apparently one fatality uh, you know, on the coast of South Carolina in the, he in the heavy surf or rip currents, not sure exactly the circumstances. Um, and we did have 10 tornadoes in the state of Florida, and one of them went not far west of my house in Weston. <laughs> I, was track I was at a conference in northeastern Florida, and I'm driving back very safely, of course. I, I was watching the radar and making sure I wasn't going through heavy rain bands. Uh, but I, I, I stopped at one rest stop and was looking at the radar, and there was a tornado going over the Everglades, west of where I live in Broward County, Florida. So, yes, we, uh, yeah, we, we did have some impacts, had more than a foot of rain in a couple spots in South Florida. So there were some impacts, and it showed how difficult it is to forecast really heavy rainfall in a localized uh, spot. So we did have some impacts, but the rest of the season for the U.S., uh, quite quiet. Um, I do want to mention, though, that Mexico was impacted quite severely this year. When you combine what happened in the Atlantic Basin and what happened in the Eastern Pacific, they were impacted directly by eight different tropical cyclones. Most of them tropical storms, a couple of them hurricanes. The flooding problems they had down there were tremendous. In fact, the folks from uh, the Mexico uh, Meteorological Service uh, visited my office uh, late in the hurricane season, and we've already begun discussions on, on how we can work together uh, to better prepare folks in, in other countries and, and, and try to enhance the messaging on the flooding from freshwater, uh, you know, due to rainfall in their mountainous terrain. Uh, so you'll hear me talk a lot about water today. You know, hurricanes and tropical storms, definitely not just about wind. That's important with the, the winds themselves, which can be damaging and deadly, and the tornado hazard. But the water hazards, I still think, in the public's eye, often get forgotten and people don't prepare and think as much about water as they do wind, even in the face of the recent events we've had in the United States with storm surge and, and freshwater flooding. And also to remind ourselves about the, the utility of the seasonal forecasts, you know, what can and what you cannot get out of them. Let's remember that even if we get the seasonal forecast exactly right, it doesn't tell us what the impacts are going to be. And I, I know most of you have seen uh, th this example before, uh, but especially for the folks uh, watching online, maybe you haven't. And this is a really good lesson for why, even if we do get the seasonal forecast right, and we did not last year. In fact, none of the seasonal forecasts uh, were correct. We, uh, all of them were pointing toward an above average year. But let's say we get the seasonal forecast exactly right. It doesn't tell you what you're going to re receive in terms of impacts where you live, and it should not influence how you prepare for the upcoming hurricane season. If you compare 2010, a very, very busy hurricane season, lots of hurricanes, uh, several major hurricanes, but none of them, not the hurricanes anyway, 
uh, hitting the United States. Earl was a close call and had some peripheral impacts, but we did not have a direct hit. And that's an above average year, but not an above average year for impacts in the United States. Compare that to 1992, way below average. The deep tropics were almost completely shut down in the Caribbean and the tropical Atlantic. And we have Category 5 Andrew hitting South Florida. So if, if that doesn't convince us that the seasonal forecast uh, doesn't tell you what you're going to experience locally, um, I don't know what a more, better example we can come up with. And so the message still remains, and I know many of you uh, help us in this regard in getting this message out, that the seasonal forecast should not determine how you prepare for the upcoming hurricane season. You have to prepare the same way every year. And so when the seasonal forecasts come out later this spring, I will spend comparatively little time talking about them and a lot more time talking about what people should be doing to prepare, talking about our enhancements to our products and services, talking about all the individual hazards and getting people focused on preparing for those. And I think one of the best things we can all do together is to really help people locally understand what hazards they are vulnerable to and what they should be doing before hurricane season to get ready for them and what they should do when a storm is on our doorstep to respond and keep themselves safe. So that's what I'm going to focus on today. Uh, if, if any of you can, by looking at these four images, within a matter of seconds, identify which tropical storm or hurricane caused the damage, then you are, you are in the know on tropical cyclones and their impacts, and probably spent too much time looking at damage photos. But, but a lot of these are very familiar scenes. And uh, I want to go through each one of these and remind ourselves about why the category or the status or the type of cyclone doesn't really matter. You can have really serious impacts in, in any kind of system. And this is to explain why we are lessening the emphasis on categories and status and what you call it and focusing more on products, services, warnings that focus on the hazards and what people locally should be doing. First one, you probably remember Tropical Storm Allison in 2001, never became a hurricane. Uh, I have family in the Houston area. That's where I spent junior high and high school. This one hit me personally. And it uh, was a very, very slow-moving tropical storm. You see right about there in the loop is when it starts to just park itself over southeastern Texas. It eventually moved across the Gulf Coast, became subtropical for a while. It hung out for quite a long time and we were measuring the rainfall in feet. We had billions of dollars in damage in the Houston area. We had fatalities. Uh, it was a very significant event, and it never became a hurricane. Uh, and, and that's an example, again, where the water was the focus. And very similar to this, Tropical Storm Debbie, 2012, one of the forgotten storms of 2012 by many people because of what happened later that year. But Tropical Storm Debbie never became a hurricane, and really never looked like much. Exposed center of circulation over the Gulf of Mexico and all the rain bands and tornadoes and heavy rains over the state of Florida, far away from the center of circulation. Uh, so again, like my predecessor Bill Reed has often said, there is no such thing as just a tropical storm. And we have to treat these very seriously, especially when it comes to the freshwater flooding and the tornado hazards. I think those are what really rear their ugly heads in tropical storms. Uh, but you still can have, as Debbie 2012 showed us, you still can have storm surge. We saw that in the Tampa Bay area uh, in Debbie. Uh, and uh, tropical storms can cause power outages, tree damage, uh, and people get into trouble on the roads because they think, well, I can get around. It's just a tropical storm. So we've, we need to really emphasize that tropical storms are not to be taken lightly uh, and focus on what, what hazards are being experienced locally, because if we focus in a tropical storm on where the center of circulation is, we could be drastically misleading people, because the rain bands could be 100 and 200 miles away. So Allison is a good example of why the status or category of a system should not be our focus. I'm sure you all remember Charlie very well, category four hurricane at landfall in southwestern Florida in 2004. My goodness, this one also hit me personally, because I had a grandmother in a mobile home living in a mobile home in the Fort Myers area. And, okay, now this, remember, and, and some of you have heard this story before, but for those who haven't, if, if someone who works at the Hurricane Center is struggling to get his family's complete preparedness plan to work properly, then, then it clearly is not something uh, that is easy to do and can be done without a little forethought. But in our case, my grandmother was in a 
mobile home. And in many previous storms and in subsequent storms, we, we went and got her out of the mobile home, brought her over to Southeast Florida. I have other family in Southeast Florida, brought her over in a more substantial structure. In the case of Charlie, she had some friends that had a substantial structure inland, and the plan was that they were going to come pick her up, and she was going to be taken inland, and that was going to save us a trip over, and she trusted them, and it was a good arrangement. Okay, that's the plan for Charlie, and that was a few days out, right? Well, as far as we knew, that's what was happening, and I'm on the operations floor at the Hurricane Center as Charlie is wobbling its way toward southwestern Florida, and for some reason I decide I'm just going to call my grandmother's mobile home just as a last check to make sure she got out as planned. And the phone rings and rings and rings, as it often did. She took her time to get up and answer the phone. She was in no hurry, didn't have to answer to anybody if she didn't want to. Uh, but eventually she picked up the phone. Hello? And I said, what are you doing there? Oh, hi, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you not out of your mobile home? Well, they didn't come and get me. And you could imagine what I'm feeling inside at that moment, not knowing if the core of Charlie's going to hit her mobile home directly or indirectly. It was the latter, fortunately for her, had some superficial damage on the mobile home. But, you know, the, you, you've really got to think ahead on what your plan is and make sure it's going to work out and it is ironclad and, and you don't want to be planning at the last minute. Uh, so that's also an example of why mobile homes are an evacuation issue regardless of what kind of system you've got. Uh, and so Charlie was about the wind, mostly. It did cause storm surge, uh, but because it was so small compared to many other hurricanes, for your average size category four hurricane, which would produce a lot more storm surge, Charlie as a smaller category four did not produce nearly as much. And there was a lot of comparison after Katrina occurred in 2005. Well, how can small I mean, well, forget the small for a moment. How can Category 4 Charlie produce so much less storm surge? And how can Katrina be only Category 3 when it has this much storm surge? Again, the categories are misleading because storm size obviously has become key in our minds in understanding what a storm can do. And if you're smaller, all things considered equal, you're not going to produce as much storm surge. If you're larger, all things considered equal, you're going to produce a lot more and you take the same hurricane, you put it in a different part of the coastline, you could get a completely different storm surge outcome. So Charlie-Katrina comparison is really helpful in understanding um, what can happen. Now, if Charlie scenario happens again, everything else is the same, but it's larger, you've got a much bigger storm surge problem. But it was also a reminder of how much hurricanes are not just a coastal event because of the inland impacts. I mean, I, Max Mayfield and I went on a, Black Hawk helicopter tour a few days after Charlie and followed the damage path of what just looked like an overblown tornado path all the way past Orlando. Uh, so folks who live in inland areas have to be reminded, I think, over and over again, especially because how many people who live in the vicinity where Charlie went didn't live there in 2004 but live there now and might not think they have a hurricane problem. So, uh, so the inland effect is another uh, lesson from Charlie. Okay, let's look at the bottom left one here. This is from Isaac of 2012. Uh, that's from the, that picture up there on the upper right now is from Laplace and the Braithwaite picture down in the bottom right. Uh, Isaac took its time to become a Category 1 hurricane, a sloppy, large tropical storm for most of its life, but it was a large, slow-moving Category 1 hurricane when it came into southeastern Louisiana. And it's almost painful just to sit there and watch that radar loop, right? Get on with it already, right? But because it took a different track than Katrina, even though the category, the overall strength was less, there are places that flooded due to storm surge that did not flood in Katrina. And that has thrown people for a loop too. How can that be? If I got through Katrina, certainly I can get through Isaac. So that's another lesson. <laughs> we, you, you may have already seen me say this on television in the past, and I'll say it again. When when we start talking about the storm that we're facing and we start comparing it to past storms, you know, we can have some of that discussion, but I will probably quickly take the discussion back to, let's keep our eye on the ball on this one. Because every storm is different and every storm has its curveballs that it's gonna throw at us and people aren't gonna be expecting it. And 
with Isaac, you know, I think we, we, we knew when we were briefing the emergency managers and talking on television and whatnot, uh, that we had some areas that were at risk that didn't flood in Katrina. And it took a lot of discussion uh, to get people over that hump to, to realize that that could be the case. So the, the, the little details of differences between one storm and the next, one hurricane and the next, can make all the difference in what your local impacts are. And again, another lesson why don't focus on the category. One versus three shouldn't be a problem. You know, that can throw you off. And then, uh, you know, so many lessons to learn from Sandy. Uh, this will be studied, discussed, I'm sure, for many years to come. Some of those lessons have turned into quick changes. Some of those things are probably going to be studied by a number of graduate student theses and doctoral dissertations for years to come. Um, from a meteorological perspective, that is quite a sight off the East Coast there. Uh, haven't seen something like that uh, in a long time, in many of our careers, but not ever. Uh, Sandy is another example of some of the things we've already talked about. That just because it only had the wind strength of a category one hurricane, and just because uh, it was no longer tropical and we knew it wasn't gonna be tropical anymore, it still was able to produce a tremendous amount of damage owing to its large size primarily. And again, all things considered equal, something that's larger is gonna produce a greater storm surge problem and for those covering things on a regional and national scale, especially, uh, the larger the system, the more people it's going to impact, the larger the scope of the disaster uh, is likely to be. Uh, Sandy also reminded us of the water hazards. And again, I, I've told this before, uh, that when a few of us flew on a, a helicopter tour arranged by FEMA a few days after Sandy, when we first flew down the New Jersey coast and first set eyes on some of the damage in person, I think all of us looked at one another and we almost, we couldn't hear one another because of the headphones, but we mouthed one another, water. You know, because you look at the, the, the roofs, the shingles aren't gone you know, on the Jersey coast. The water did that damage. It's crystal clear that that's uh, the primary mechanism of the damage there and that there was a lot of wave action. So when I look down the coast from Sandy and I look at places like Savannah, Georgia, hasn't been hit in a long time by a hurricane, over a century. Look at the Tampa Bay area, which has dealt with some uh, glancing blows by comparison to what they got in 1921. All kinds of places that haven't been impacted by a major hurricane and a major storm surge event. Oh, by the way, that includes the county I live in. Uh, Broward County, Florida, yes, we had Wilma. Yes, we had impacts from other systems in recent years, but we have not had that major impact from the east with a major storm surge event in a long, long time. And so, I'm hoping that one of the things we can do with Sandy is show people, well, if, if a big storm surge event can happen that far north, then you folks down in the southeast and Gulf Coast, you think you're off the hook in any way? Uh, there's, there's got to be, I think, a resurgence of our emphasis on getting people aware of if they are vulnerable to the storm surge hazard and what they should be doing to prepare for it. So one of the questions I'm asking over and over again and will be doing for the next several months and probably longer than that, when I talk to an individual, when I'm speaking at a conference, I'm going to ask this question, are you in a zone? Are you in a storm surge zone, a hurricane evacuation zone? I'm not talking about the flood plains area and, and how that affects uh, your, 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 your flood insurance policies and all that. I'm talking about the, the evacuation zones that emergency managers have prescribed to utilize during uh, an approaching hurricane. You know, these evacuation zones are things that are decided already uh, based on input from our storm surge unit at the Hurricane Center, uh, where we look at all the potential scenarios for storm surge in various uh, spots around the country. And then the emergency management community prescribes the evacuation zones. But I am convinced that there are so many people that don't even know the answer to the basic question, what zone do I live in? Do I live in one at all? In fact, there is a media person who is not in this room, and I won't name him or her, <clears throat> who I talked about with this issue within the 18 or so months since I took this job. After I went on my spiel about uh, knowing if uh, you live in a storm surge evacuation zone, you know, offline after the interview, uh, this uh, media person said to me, you know, I don't even know if I live in an evacuation zone. And, and I told them, again, this is totally offline, and I, I didn't publicize this, but... Uh, I, I said to this person, you ought to do a story about you. 
you know, and, and, and show people what it takes to find out if you live in an evacuation zone and how you went about dealing with that information. Because if you think about it, and I, I've done this for years, going around the country saying over and over again all of our favorite cliches, right? You know, get your disaster supply kit, uh, get your family plan together, uh, all of these cliches that we use. And I think in the past, before we started to realize how much people didn't understand about storm surge and about the water hazards of tropical storms and hurricanes, I think we presumed that if we simply said those things enough, prepare, prepare, get your disaster kit, uh, get ready for hurricane season, get a plan, all of that, that by doing that, people would respond and uh, that would hopefully, for the most part, take care of it. Uh, but I think we're finding out that it, we need to make it even easier for people to get this information. And if they don't have a knowledge of what evacuation zone, if any, that they live in, then let's face it, the one's hurricane preparedness plan for yourself or your family or your business is flawed from the start. Because if you don't know if you're going to be staying during hurricane or going, or at least there's, if, there's a, if you don't know if there's a potential that you'll be told to evacuate and you don't plan for that in advance, it's probably not going to go real well when you try to throw that plan together at the last minute. And if you don't know if you're staying or going, how do you figure out what supplies you need? How do you figure out uh, how people are going to get a hold of you? How do you figure out what to do to your house to get it ready? Because if you're not going to be there, there's some things you should do before you leave. Uh, so getting that hurricane preparedness plan together for folks in hurricane prone areas, I think starts with answering the question, am I in an evacuation zone? And so I, I, I hope that we can work together with the emergency management community. You know, this would involve weather service, and our media partners, and our emergency management partners in, in doing everything we can to make these evacuation zones easier to find out. So if, you, if you're not convinced that people don't know their risk to storm surge, let me show some examples of information uh, that some of our social science uh, colleagues have shared with us. Many of you might know who Betty Morrow is. Uh, she's a South Floridian, uh, been doing uh, social science work for a long time. And this is one graphic she uh, has shared with us. This is from her uh, uh, talking to folks in the North Georgia, Georgia coast area. A very vulnerable area, the Savannah, Tybee Island, all that. And uh, this isn't even a depiction of evacuation zones. This is simply land elevation. And the redder you are, the closer you are to being sea level. So it's, it's a proxy for your, your vulnerability. But, I, but for those not vulnerable with this area, trust me, the storm surge problem goes way inland from the immediate coast. And the dots represent the, the responses that she received to the question of whether or not people thought, based on where they live, if they, would, if they thought it was likely or not very likely or somewhat likely that storm surge could flood their home, you know, what, what do they think their vulnerability is? Um, and if, uh, if you see a lot of green dots where there's a red background, we've got a problem. Those folks are saying, no, it's probably not. Now, part of what might be going on here, <clears throat> I think, is that people are thinking that the chances of it ever happening are so low that even if it could happen, I'm not going to spend a lot of time worrying about it and certainly not do anything about it. Uh, that's part of the problem, the rarity of these things. And of course, this is an area that hasn't been impacted directly by a major hurricane and a severe storm surge event in over a century. Of course, when that did happen, hundreds of lives were lost. Uh, it's, it's a very vulnerable area. So there's, there's one area. Let's look uh, to the Mississippi coast, a, a very similar uh, set of questions. This does depict the evacuation zones, a couple of evacuation zones in red and orange. Um, and this was talking about evacuation intent. So if, you, if your dot is red, you're saying you're not likely to evacuate. So if, look at all those red dots down in the evacuation zone. And you know, even though we got a lot of green dots in the evacuation zone, okay, that's good, but you have a lot of green dots outside the evacuation zone. That poses a little bit of a problem too because then you're gonna have the wrong people evacuating and clogging up the roads for the, for the red dots that need to be getting out and aren't. So, Clearly, the understanding of whether or not you're in an evacuation zone is a problem, but then, even if they know whether or not they think that's a hazard, they really need to do something about. Uh, so we have a problem there. Uh, from Jay Baker, some of you might know him. Um, he did some uh, surveys of folks uh, in association with Sandy and asked uh, a, a general question. He could provide a lot more details than, than I can about this, but this is a, a really good 
general view of some of the misconceptions folks have. Intention to evacuate relative to your proximity to water. Now, why in the world is it that your intent to evacuate would go down as you get closer to the water? You know, there's, and, and related to that, also from Jay, uh, th there's a lot of colors here, but the red bars that go way above 50%, whether or not you're less than or equal to a block from the water or you're greater than a block from the water, the hazard of greatest concern to people is wind, even if they live right near the water, even if they can see the water from their living room. They're still more worried about the wind, generally. Now, a lot of folks indicated here uh, that they're worried about wind and surge, uh, but that's less than wind. It, that needs to be higher. So clearly, there's a lack of understanding of the storm surge hazard and uh, a greater concern about wind than water. So we need to be asking this question to the folks that watch our television stations and the folks that are part of our warning areas at the Weather Service and folks that the emergency managers serve. We got to get this, this information out. And one of the big misconceptions is, well, this, this is a beach problem. So generally speaking, it's simple, right? That you know, folks who live near the beach and, and can see the water, well, they're the ones who are most likely to be in evacuation zone. But look at these screenshots from the state of Florida. Any Seminoles here like me? Tallahassee area. You don't have to go very far south of Tallahassee to be in a storm surge evacuation zone. Very vulnerable area. It can go a dozen miles. There you go. <laughs> We're not talking about a few blocks. We're talking miles from the immediate shoreline. And there's a little zoom in. So people who live in Woodville, Wakulla Springs, evacuation zones. They need to have a plan for evacuation. Look at the area to the west of Okeechobee, Lake Okeechobee. There are evacuation zones in South Florida that go 15, 20, 25 miles inland from the immediate coastline because they're so vulnerable, so low-lying. And it's not just because of the low-lying nature of the land. It has to do with how deep, how fast the water gets deep offshore. And on, on the west side of Florida, including up to the Panhandle, you have a, a very shallow Gulf of Mexico for quite a ways out. And that enables the storm surge to build up more and go farther inland. Take the same storm going into southeast Florida, you put it in southwest Florida, you're going to get more storm surge farther inland because of the, sh the shape of the coastline and bathymetry of the ocean offshore. And even look at uh, the Port St. Lucie, Jensen Beach area in Florida. People might not realize that because waterways connected to the ocean go inland, that brings a storm surge risk to them. And they might not think, I don't live anywhere near the beach, but they live near water, and they have a risk. It ought to be as easy for people to get out their smartphone and find out if they live in an evacuation zone as it is to find the nearest Lowe's or Home Depot or Walmart or McDonald's or whatever. In fact, I did a little test one day just to entertain my family. Because I, I, was, I was ranting about the storm surge evacuation zone issue in my own house. And of course, they, they have to listen to me go on about this all the time. And they you know, think, is this really that big of a problem? I said, let me test this. So I got out my phone, got on, to, got on Siri, and I asked Siri, Who's the catcher for the Florida Marlins? I got an answer in five seconds. I said, do I live in a hurricane evacuation zone in Western Florida? Would you like to do a web search for that? <laughs> you know, it shouldn't be that hard. It's, it's, the information's out there. If we make it more easy for people to find it and we advertise that it's there, I think we're going to have a much better chance of people um, responding and, and being knowledgeable about their risk. And that, I think, is important even before we talk about the new products and warnings that I'm going to summarize here in a little bit, we've got to get people better prepared, and I think there's something we can do for the public and not just keep asking the public to, to better understand it on their own. Yes? Okay. Howard Bernstein, WSA. Do you guys have the resources, um, whether budgetary or whatever, to develop an app for that and make it available for people? So the question is, do we have the resources to develop an app for this? Um, if I, at the moment, no, uh, because most of our resources at the Hurricane Center and in the Weather Service are devoted to our operations and enhancing our products and services and warnings. We do obviously have a huge outreach component to what we do, and we apply resources to that. But to better answer your question, I would say that this is a joint effort, a joint issue between us and emergency management and media. To, I, 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 because ultimately, the evacuation zones 
are the purview of the emergency managers. They are the ones who devise the evacuation zones. We give them guidance on where the areas of risk are. Uh, but they, des they decide where the evacuation zones are. And uh, I think it's really going to be a partnership with them. And also, I would also uh, uh, mention that you know, there are partners that we all are aware of uh, that are, are good at public education programs and things like social norming, you know, like folks at, the, the, at FLASH, Federal Alliance for Safe Homes. That's a, that's a partner of the Weather Service uh, that, that has helped us do things uh, along the lines of public education. Uh, so th those are some folks we're talking to. Uh, but we need to, as a community, together work on this. And, and I would envision, uh, if I could wave the magic wand right now, some kind of public education program that's designed by people that know how to do that sort of thing that our media partners would help us promote and that the emergency managers would be the source information for what they want us to promote. Because evacuation zones and evacuation routes and, and the procedures that they want their local residents to follow differs from state to state or even from locality to locality. And so whatever it is that the emergency managers locally are telling their citizens they should be doing to deal with the evacuation issue, that's the information we want to promote. But whatever it is, we want to make it easier for people to find. So. Uh, now I'm Do you run into the situation that the people you most need to educate are the people who just won't listen? How do we cross that barrier? Do you understand that? Yes, question? I understand the question. It, it, are, are the people who we most want to uh, convince of what they should do and, and educate them the people who are least likely to listen? I think there are, there's every combination. I think there are people who really do want to know what their risk is and are having trouble finding it. And I, and I know that for a fact because when I was in the media world, I got those calls. I got those social media messages asking, I need to know my evacuation zone. And I couldn't find it really quickly in some cases. So there are people who are looking for it and having trouble finding it. But there are probably people who, who are also, like you say, uh, tuning out and are going to be hard to convince. Sure, but th there's every combination. But whatever state of mind folks in the public are in, I think we can all as a community do more to increase the chances that they know their risk and do something about it. So, but yes, there is, there is that issue that you described. So, get off the soapbox about the evacuation zones, but, uh, but let's presume that everybody knows their evacuation zone and is ready to do what emergency managers tell them to do. What is going to be new and different? What are we going to be doing from the weather service side to help emergency managers make those evacuation decisions, because it is their decision to make. And what tools are we going to be putting in the hands of our media partners to help you communicate the storm surge risk and hazard better? And where does all that meet? Because ultimately, I think what we want to accomplish here is we want people to know their evacuation zone and plan ahead for evacuation if they're told. And they, and they go when they're told to do so by emergency managers, hopefully bolstered by the fact that our media partners have been reinforcing that message from the emergency managers and are armed with information from the National Weather Service that helps explain why it is that area is being told to evacuate. Because there is a new way to convey that and there's a new storm surge warning that we'll get to in a little bit. Uh, now I know again from my time, relatively short as it was, uh, in the media uh, that I didn't have all the tools I needed to convey the storm surge hazard. And I think that's on us in the Weather Service to, to fix that problem. And we've known for over a decade, I think, that we needed to come up with something new, or some new things, plural, to enhance our communication of storm surge in real time. You know, we've, we've talked at, at length here already about the preparedness component of that, which we will continue to, to harp on. But we need information that better conveys the storm surge hazard when there's a hurricane or tropical storm on our doorstep. When I was on television, I remember preparing to go on the air without any real good idea about what this particular storm was going to do in terms of storm surge inundation over land areas. How far inland? Is this specific area at risk? Is that specific area at risk? Uh, there are a lot of tools that emergency managers use to make those decisions, but in terms of a public product and a tool the media can use, uh, if you look at most storm surge graphics up to now, 
on any local or national media outlet. It's usually been uh, a strip of, of color along the coast that says five to seven feet or something. And that's based on what the Hurricane Center is saying in its public advisory text product. We're saying from here to here, four to eight. From here to here, nine to 12. And that's what gets depicted. But what is missing from that is, okay, so four to eight feet of storm surge along the coastline generally where I live. Well, how deep would the water get above ground where I live? Is it gonna get far enough inland to get to where I live? Those are the two things we've not been conveying, but this new graphic does convey those things. Uh, now again, this is the example we've shown over and over, and uh, you know, our storm surge unit at the Hurricane Center is working really hard to get ready for this graphic to be publicly available on our Hurricane Center website, starting with the 2014 hurricane. The potential based on this latest advisory uh, and it, in addition to showing uh, how far inland from the coast, it gives you some sense of how deep the water could get. Uh, so those are the, the big benefits of this kind of depiction. It will not look exactly like this on the Hurricane Center website this year. Our intent is to use web services, which would essentially give you the ability to zoom and pan a little bit. It's not going to be one view. Now, you're not going to be able to zoom into your backyard level <laughs> because we don't have that kind of precision, and we don't want folks getting that uh, exact with it. Uh, but you are going to be able to zoom and pan. That's our intent. And it would be a graphic that would be updated with every new advisory on the system from the Hurricane Center, and we would probably start kicking off this graphic when we first issue a tropical storm or hurricane watch. I saw a hand in back. Yeah. Just a quick question. Is that based on topography alone, or is that also based on ocean bathymetry? It, it, yeah, the question is, is, is this based on land elevation alone, or is it based on bathymetry? The answer is both, and here's why. Because the, the storm surge model the slosh model that our storm surge unit has used for years and years and years uh, is still the model in play here. The difference is it's being run hundreds of times on a supercomputer after each advisory is put together to create a probabilistic depiction of storm surge, a, a depiction of the uncertainty. This is not a depiction of what we're saying the flooding depth will be with complete certainty at that location. What we are saying is there is a, a significant chance of the water being that deep at that location, whatever location you pick on the map. But as the system gets closer to landfall, that area will be refined. Question? Uh, yeah, Rick Howard Burns in WUSA. Are you also going to be working with uh, the vendors for the broadcasters yes. so that this data is available so that we can bring it into our systems and have a nice display that matches our look on air? Great question. Uh, are we going to be providing the data so that it can be brought into on-air television systems? In 2014, the answer is no, but our intent is to go in that direction. This year is going to be an experimental year for the graphic and with the zoom and pan capability we intend. On our website, that's all, that's all we're going to be able to get across the finish line for this year, but our intent, our hope is that for 2015, the underlying data could be served up uh, and we're working with folks higher up in the Weather Service to, to put these mechanisms and processes in place so that the data can be served up and that uh, emergency managers, media folks, whomever, can bring the data into their systems. And there's going to have to be, admittedly, a lot of conversation between now and then about how that's going to happen, what works best with your systems. Uh, we're doing this in a GIS environment, and we have to blend this into how the Weather Service is doing GIS services, and those are evolving. So this is, in some ways, pushing the envelope. Uh, but that's the, the reason for your question is why we're doing that. But we're just not going to be ready to do it this year. Rick, Joe from WTAJ yes. again in Pennsylvania. Um, a lot of times we think technology and using Google Earth and the pan, zoom, tilt, it's really good running a script on the web page. It looks really good for the user. However, even though our vendors can't, won't have something this year, if you just simply have still options that we can grab and put into our systems, it's a lot better. We can't do that with a lot of those manipulating maps mm -hmm. as easily. Sure, and you, we will try to make it as easy and usable for anyone uh, as possible. And, and I know, you know media folks use uh, graphics from web pages, both government and university and otherwise. Uh, and some of those look pretty good on the air. And, and, and we're, we're, we would certainly give you the ability to have the, the wide view, the complete shot, 
so that you can bring that on the air. But I could envision some of you doing a little bit of zooming and panning on the fly uh, if, if, it, if it comes across well on television. Um, so you know, it'll be an experiment this year. We're going to do it as well as we can uh, with the resources we have at the Hurricane Center in our storm surge unit. And um, I think you'll be able to show it on the air. Uh, but again, later, hopefully starting in 2015, we might have some data underlying that you could bring into your systems. Because that would be, that'd be ideal, right? To be able to show a depiction and, and throw up all kinds of information on top of the, the graphical depiction of the data so that you can put roads on there and you can put cities on there and, and communicate to the people you're trying to communicate to. Because the cities or the, 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 uh, the legends and whatever that we've put on our map might not be exactly what suits you the best. Although I will say this, it's important to remind everyone of this, that the design of this graphic, the colors, the labeling, what color the ocean is relative to land, the wording that we're using in the description of the graphic have all been carefully thought out and, and utilizing input via social science analysis of, of uh, feedback from media partners, from emergency managers, et cetera, and folks elsewhere within the Weather Service. Sure, and, and that's why, and that's why, yeah, and again, that doesn't mean it, <clears throat> that doesn't mean it will fit everyone's needs to a T, but it does give us the best chance for the greatest utility by the most people for a graphic on a website. <laughs> but we know that the underlying data are of value, and you could utilize it to much greater benefit. So, so it, it, it matters in the sense that we haven't just d designed the graphic ourselves without asking folks uh, what would be the most uh, useful. And again, with a web graphic, you want to increase the chances that even somebody looking at it with no other description or explanation has a, a, a decent chance of grasping what it means. And that's why we, we are, you know, we, the title in the legend is potential storm surge flooding. Those are key words. Potential means we're not saying this is going to happen at that spot. That is what the potential is at that spot, each spot on the map. And flooding is intended to convey, it's, it's the above ground depth of the water. It's not storm surge over some fancy reference level. It's how deep the water could get. Is so, there, yes, sir. No, no, this is a storm surge graphic. It does not take into account rainfall and inland flooding. That hazard obviously does not occur in reality in a complete vacuum relative to the storm surge flooding, but our, our modeling capabilities aren't quite there yet where we can merge those two. But certainly that's the direction we want to head in. But we do provide input from our modeling output that creates this graphic into river forecast models. And we certainly convey separately the local watches and warnings and rainfall potential uh, due to freshwater flooding. So that's, that graphic's coming out uh, in 2014. Then by 2015, I know you've seen, many of you have seen this uh, graphic before. It's essentially just a visual aid to give you an idea of what the storm surge watch and warning are intended to be. Not just a strip along the coast, but uh, on a grid, essentially, lighting up the areas that have a significant chance for life-threatening storm surge. And this is something we've been thinking about, even put some pen to paper as far back as 2002 with internal discussions about the need for a separate watch and warning different from the hurricane and tropical storm watch and warning. And again, if you haven't heard this example of why that's important. Think back to Hurricane Ike of 2008, where the water started to rise on the southeast Texas coast before the winds of tropical storm force got there. And think of Dennis in 2005, where the storm surge happened well outside the hurricane and even tropical storm force winds in the big bend of Florida. So storm surge can easily happen in a different place and a different time as compared to the hurricane or even tropical storm force winds. And you know, the, the things that people should do in response to the wind hazard are different than the storm surge hazard. The evacuation zones we've talked about are for storm surge. Now, folks in mobile homes, high rises, what else? Uh, the vulnerable structures of any kind might need to leave because of the wind hazard. But primarily, evacuation is due to storm surge. And this warning is intended to highlight the areas uh, where we think there's a significant chance of storm surge happening, which we think will bolster 
the messaging to convince people to pay attention to those evacuation instructions. Uh, it's not intended to replace it. And, and by the way, this graphic and the underlying data, when they're eventually available, we think could be a very positive game changer for how emergency managers make their decisions on evacuation, which is largely based on category and, and a, a number of uh, scenarios that they're looking at that are category specific. But this data could enable them to overlay it with their evacuation zones and it would much more quickly become apparent which zones are at risk. So this is a decision making tool as well as a communications tool. We're going to be going through all kinds of exercises with emergency managers to, to help them figure out how to use this new tool. But then the storm surge warning is mostly going to be a communications tool. Even for the decision maker who might, the emergency manager might go to his elected official and say, well, we, we have these evacuation zones that appear to be greatly at risk due to the modeling that we're looking at from the Hurricane Center. <clears throat> Someone from Florida almost evaporates in Colorado, so pardon us. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> so <clears throat> an emergency manager might go to his elected official and say, <clears throat> the Hurricane Center is, is conveying to us that these evacuation zones are <clears throat> excuse me, at great risk uh, and we want to evacuate them. But if on top of that there is a storm surge warning in these areas, it could enhance the ability of emergency managers to, to make those decisions with confidence and to convince elected officials. So uh, in addition to that, thank you, Dave. <laughs> um, in addition to it being a, a uh, re an emphasizing point for decision makers making the evacuation decisions, it really is a communications tool. A warning is intended to evoke a response. It's intended to get people to take action. We're already working on the call to action statements for this warning, which we're intending to be available in 2015. We have a, a storm surge warning implementation team in the Weather Service. We and the local forecast offices are working through how this warning would be collaboratively decided upon. And importantly for you folks, how it would be communicated such that you can show it on the air. And uh, there's a lot of work to do between now and then. Uh, and if your question uh, coming to mind might be, is there going to be a storm surge watch as well? The answer is yes. And what would be the time frame? We haven't finalized it, but the general idea is <clears throat> on a similar time frame as the existing hurricane watch and warning, meaning that a storm surge watch would come out about 48 hours before whatever weather uh, phenomenon is, gonna, is anticipated to start, which would in, impede evacuation. So a 48-hour notice on what time you have left to evacuate for a significant storm surge. Probably not going to be five or six feet, so probably somewhere in between there, which would be the criteria that would trigger the storm surge watcher warning. So that's uh, 2015. And if you combine that with potentially the underlying data from the graphic I showed you previously, there would be a lot of new tools for you in the communications business to utilize. Craig. Uh, in the interim, before this goes into effect, Michael, let me Craig Setzer, CBS Miami. So in the interim, before this goes into effect, is the National Hur Hurricane Center going to do anything different when there is a significant storm surge threat as, as opposed to what's happened in the past? Well, in 2014, we'll have the graphic out there. Um, but the storm surge warning is going to go through, go through some internal testing in 2014. And if there aren't um, you know, land-threatening systems, then we'll do some mock uh, advisories to, to test the, the cranks on collaborating with the National Weather Service. And also, we have to figure out how prescribing this warning works into the workflow for the hurricane specialists. What's going to be the actual mechanism for exchanging the data between us and the WFOs? And, and also, uh, we're, at some point soon, we're going to have to provide some uh, sample data sets for the warning to, to emergency management media partners so they are informed about what's coming and how they're going to be uh, bring it into their systems and how they're going to be displaying it. And we are working on the emergency alert component of this. How's EAS going to be triggered by this? So we're working on that. 
Uh, so there's a lot to do, and we will involve you along the way. But this year in 2014, the warning's not going to go out to the public. Yeah. So, okay, any other questions about the warning or the graphic uh, with Storm Surge? Got a couple other things to, to finish up on. Okay. Okay, so another thing that is coming out in 2014, it might not look exactly like this. This is just a mock-up, and we are working on uh, how it will exactly look. But we did decide at our end-of-season NOAA hurricane meeting in December that we are going to come out in 2014, that's the plan, with a graphic depicting the potential for development of new systems all the way out to five days. Now, you might recall in August of last year, we initiated our text tropical weather outlook product going beyond 48 hours and conveying the potential for new systems to develop all the way out to five days. Uh, that will continue and be operational in the text product this year. It was experimental last year. And you'll see a table in the product, in the text product, listing out the systems and their potential for development out to five days. The graphic will be the new thing. And we, we, as, as we uh, go through our uh, outreach and conference season the next several months, we will be sharing more and more examples of this product with you uh, and getting some feedback. It'll be an experimental graphic this year, so the feedback and uh, uh, and the tweaking of it will go on even after the season starts. But what's the idea here? The idea here is to identify all systems that have potential to become the next tropical depression or tropical storm within the next five days and to depict the area in which that formation is probable to occur, if it does, and to color code it by the level of probability that we already express in the text product. You might recall from the text product, we already say both out to two days and out to five days, uh, whether it's a low, medium, or high chance of development. We put a 10%, you know, a percentage chance on that, 0, 10, 20, up to 100. And that's color-coded yellow, orange, red. We're going to color-code the five-day probability on this graphic. So systems that have a high chance of developing within five days will be colored red. And the benefit of doing that area of where the genesis is probable to occur if it does is it gives you a cone-ish, track-ish kind of depiction of where the system is generally headed. It's not going to be a track forecast, an intensity forecast like we do for the active cyclones, but this will give you some idea of where it's headed, especially look at the, the, the long red one there that, that ends up near Puerto Rico and the Eastern Caribbean. You know, the business end of it is, with these, is the X. That's where the system is currently located, generally speaking. And then the area, because it goes out to five days and the system is going to be moving generally westward, the area depicts a westward movement, even though it's not a track forecast. But because out to five days, if it takes that long to form, it'll be much farther west, it gives you an idea where it's going. And that's really beneficial, I think, for something that's on our doorstep and might be forming right in the Gulf of Mexico, we'll give you some depiction of where we think it's headed. Dave. Rick, uh, Dave Jones with Storm Center Communications. I was just wondering if... Um, you, the Hurricane Center produced a series of really good videos, one of the ones we used to introduce you uh, this morning at the Weather and Climate Summit. Do you think uh, it might be useful to produce a video describing this product and putting it up on the website as well? Because, uh, because it looks like a hurricane track. You know, you don't want to have that kind of confusion that all these are hurricanes out there. Um, but uh, to the public, I think all of the meteorologists and broadcasters in the room all of those watching live on the stream should really make this a story and mm -hmm. focus in on the reason why the Hurricane Center is doing this. I think it's a great idea, but I do see some, you know, uh, confusion perhaps with sure. the public saying it looks like a bunch of hurricanes out there. Sure. Well, let me answer, answer your question about should we do a video about this particular product. Uh, lots of answers to that. One is... Uh, that's one thing we rely on our media partners to help us do, is to tell the story in a, in a, in a compelling way with video. <clears throat> so to some extent, we rely on you to help us do that. But as you saw, we, we have produced some of our own. Most of our efforts right now, heading into the core of the off-season here, on producing multimedia content to help explain changes to our upcoming products and services are being, are being pushed toward the storm surge arena to explain those, th that new graphic that's going experimental this year. 
and there are going to be video explanations of those products and a number of different things that are going to go to emergency managers, something that's going to go to media. So we're already thinking along those lines and, and tangibly working on that kind of thing for the storm surge. We'll have to see if we can find the resources or if not, get some assistance in, um, in producing multimedia content for this particular product. Because it is important, as you say, for people to understand what it is conveying and what it is not conveying. Uh, just as an example, too, it's not always simple, right? Sometimes a system that might form as a tropical cyclone in the Western Caribbean, for example, that system might not even exist right now. But in looking at the model depictions, there's uh, a significant level of confidence that something's going to form there and there's a chance that uh, we'll get a cyclone within five days. Also, sometimes you have what I call a disembodied depiction where you might have some sort of mid-level vorticity maximum or something. Some, some areas spin over the continental U.S. and some portion of that interacts with other things in the Gulf of Mexico when you got moisture, maybe you got a trailing front, who knows what, and the cyclogenesis won't occur until here. But it's not going to occur between here and here, over land. Uh, that happened a few years ago. I remember being on the operations floor, seeing something come down from the, from the Ohio Valley, and we ended up getting a, a short-lived uh, depression or storm over the Gulf of Mexico. So sometimes they won't be attached. And we have to decide how much of this we're going to do all on. Systems are uh, probable to form or if they do form, and we'll give you the, the chances of it color-coded. Wayne. Hey, Rick. Uh, Wayne Higgins, Climate Program Office. Um, so the Climate Prediction Center currently issues um, a hazards uh, assessment for the global tropics, actually, including the Atlantic Basin, that uh, includes week one and week two threats for tropical cyclone activity. And so my question to you is um, simply, are you coordinating with the Climate Prediction Center on this product. They don't depict, for example, cones of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. they, they show general areas where you're, there's the expectation of enhanced or suppressed activity based on tropical features like the Madden-Julian oscillation and others. So mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, are you coordinating with the Climate Prediction Center on this product? Yeah, so Dr. Higgins is asking about our coordination with the Climate Prediction Center, uh, which we do have communications with on a fairly ongoing basis when it comes to their week one and week two products, which are more broadly based and not system specific, uh, and involve discussing some of these, uh, these factors like MJO. Now, in order to put this particular product out, and again, it has a text and a graphical component, the duty hurricane specialists on the floor at the Hurricane Center are going to have to do all of that in a relatively short amount of time because we've had to work really hard to work the provision of this new product into our operational workflow and it's not really going to be feasible in that time frame because this is going to be updated every six hours uh, you know day and night throughout the hurricane season uh, so that particular product won't be coordinated with CPC but there will be an ongoing discussion about Okay, well, because we're going to be we're going to be thinking out to five days. Why do we think the chances are high for this to form in the Western Caribbean? And is that part of a, a broader setup that affects what happens uh, beyond that time in a more general sense? Yes. So, and not only will we be coordinating in that regard um, with the generalized outlooks going beyond five days uh, in their in CPC products, but we're going to have an ongoing discussion with them for months and years to come about you know. What happens years down the road uh, to go beyond five days? What, what do we say beyond five days uh, in the future? But this is, this is pushing the envelope pretty far as it, as it stands uh, to go out five days with a, a, a probabilistic forecast of system-specific new formation of, of storms and hurricanes and depressions. Okay. The last thing I want to do is pose a question to you that I'd like you to seriously consider. And, and give us feedback on as this off-season progresses. The question is, would it be beneficial from a communication standpoint, and we're talking to emergency managers in terms of a decision-making standpoint as well, for us to issue at, from the Hurricane Center tropical storm, or if it's really appearing to ramp up quickly, hurricane, but for the most part this would be tropical storm watches and warnings for our coastal areas even before we have a depression or a storm, but without an accompanying track and intensity forecast. 
because we are pretty sure we're closer to being able to usefully place tropical storm watches and warnings for a developing system while it's a lot farther down the road to be able to put out track and intensity forecasts that have uh, an acceptable level of skill. We've been trying that internally and we're still going to continue doing that, but it's a real challenge. And it's also a workflow issue, by the way, to work in track and intensity forecasts for individual systems that have a high chance of development. That's a lot of work. Uh, and, but we think we can work in this. And it's related to what we just talked about, whereby it might be that the tropical weather outlook would be the potential vehicle for a tropical storm watcher warning to be disseminated for a system that is not an active tropical cyclone yet. And it also could be that in addition to identifying the land areas that have the wind risks such they need a tropical storm watcher warning, that either as a companion to this graphic or potentially you could put them on top of one another where you would have that development potential area depicted along with the watches and warnings. So you are saying in general, this is generally where the system is headed and where its center would be if it becomes a tropical cyclone. And these are the areas, more importantly, that within the next 36 or 48 hours have a significant chance of tropical storm force winds occurring. So that's the question. Could, could we do that usefully? Would that be a communications tool that would benefit you even if there's not an exact tracker intensity forecast? Uh, but I think that it, it is the right way to go, but I'm, I didn't want to make the decision for 2014 and do that uh, without having a dialogue with the community. But this what? is something we're going to be talking a lot about. We have a team formed within the Weather Service that will be examining all the issues. How would we disseminate it uh, via the tropical weather outlook? How, what are the issues with it not coming along with the track and intensity forecast? Uh, how do we merge it with the tropical weather outlook for dissemination? Uh, how does it affect decision making and all of that? So we're going to be seeking your feedback for, for the next year. What about Joe Murga from THJ? Um, what about though? I mean, nowadays there were so many severe thunderstorm watches that a lot of people just discount them. Are you worried about a situation where then people become immune mm -hmm. to the watches if they're put out too far in advance and there's too many of them? And okay. false alarms that may go with some of them too, which mm -hmm. further numb people's uh, attention to this. Yes, uh, very good questions and valid concerns and one of the reasons why we haven't done it previously because of the risk of false alarms. Uh, but it would have the same time frame as the existing tropical storm watcher warning. So this would address the problem of a system that's near land areas and is trying to form almost right on top of us. And uh, that has a high chance of formation because it would be tied to this product. And in the text and graphic, we'll be conveying those systems that have a high chance of development within 48 hours. And maybe it would be only those that would merit additionally having land-based tropical storm watches a warning. So that would, would not happen so frequently that it would dumb it down. We definitely don't want it to be, the effectiveness of these watches warnings to be lessened. So it would be for chances of high, develop, high chance of development, would be near land so that it's still within the 36 to 48 hour time frame. And it would avoid the potential problem on the other extreme as compared to what you just described, whereby something pretty impactful happens and there wasn't a watch or warning until the very last minute when we first pulled the trigger on advisories. So there's a balance there, but I think overall the benefits would outweigh the negatives, but especially for the emergency managers who are used to seeing uh, a track and intensity forecast in HERVAC and it drives all their tools and decision making, can they make use of a watch or warning before Genesis? Craig. Yeah, Craig Setzer, CBS Miami. I, I think the two, I, I really love the idea of the, the pre-advisory watch warnings um, just for that reason because, you know, you get a bigger window. But uh, I think it has to go hand in hand with some area that describes where the storm is going because without it, it mm -hmm. leads to a lot of speculation and us as people on TV would be saying now it looks like it would be going in this general direction based on the, the watches and warnings. So with this graphic help Absolutely. do that, even if it's not a, a, a point by point track and intensity forecast like for the cyclone. Absolutely. Okay. Good. Thanks for that feedback. Okay. So we can continue to have that discussion. I wanted to pose that. We're going to be discussing this uh, for the next year and next December at our end of se season meeting. I hope that we can make a decision on what to do for 2015. So there could be a lot changing 
uh, in 2015. Uh, I just wanted to highlight briefly before I conclude, and I take a lot more of your questions and answers, and hopefully some folks online have some as well, uh, that we do have international responsibilities in the National Weather Service. And if you're not aware, the National Hurricane Center is what is called an RSMC, Regional Specialized Meteorological Center, as designated by the WMO. World Meteorological Organization, and that's under the umbrella of the United Nations. Uh, it's an official mandate that we have, official responsibility. So our, our track and intensity forecasts that are issued for any cyclone in the Atlantic, Caribbean, Gulf, Mexico, Eastern Pacific, uh, we have to put those out. That's part of our operational mission. And the other countries put out their own watches and warnings, but with our guidance. Uh, and we are already starting to get, as you might expect, some interest from the other countries on what we're doing in the United States moving forward on storm surge. A lot of international interest is there, and so going forward over the next many years, it'll take a while to, to build up such capability, but I, I hope that somewhere down the road, in the not so distant future, that we are able to do uh, some provision of storm surge forecast products to help uh, other countries uh, prepare for the hazard uh, in real time the same way that we are intending to do here in the next couple of years. Uh, the other thing I'll mention on the international front uh, is that, uh, oh, and by the way, before I leave that other one, we, we definitely need to get our domestic storm surge enhancements across the finish line uh, before we apply a lot of resources internationally, but the conversation uh, can start. Uh, and also, by the way, um, we do have in mind domestically that if any kind of system, tropical or extratropical or post-tropical or whatever, is going to pose life-threatening storm surge, that it could, it, why can't that have a storm surge warning as well? So we're starting to have conversations about, you know, in the middle of winter, if you have a big system, whether it's a March 93 superstorm or it's a nor'easter on the East Coast, something that could produce the same amount of storm surge, why shouldn't it get the same warning? So uh, that's something that's being discussed. Uh, and we are starting to work toward better modeling capabilities to be able to do that. So lots happening even more than what I've described today uh, on storm surge. The other thing that's happening internationally is that we are really hoping that we can resume the Caribbean Hurricane Awareness Tour this spring. That was canceled last year due to the budget limitations in our country. And I am not shy about saying I really want the domestic Hurricane Awareness Tour to resume. I think that would be a tremendous way to really get the nation focused on this Weather Ready Nation initiative and get ambassadors participating in that program and also get these major issues across about what people should be doing at a basic level to get ready for the hazards of a hurricane, know their evacuation zone. And our media partners are absolutely critical in that effort. So this is not just uh, throwing around some ideas and some programs. This is the real deal where if we get out there with something like an awareness tour like we did in the past, and we have some really good visuals for the media to, to utilize, because I know you need that to tell the story that's compelling, and you've got kids going on to a Hurricane Hunter plane, and you can talk to folks and, uh, and help us get that word out. So whatever we can do, I hope I speak for the rest of the Weather Service, I, whatever we can do to make the preparedness message more interesting and more television ready, uh, I'm all game for that. And uh, whatever you can do to help us in that regard, you know, let us know. So we're working on that. And then finally, the conversation never ends when uh, we when we stop these uh, conferences with social media, we can be in touch. I, I'm more and more doing some direct messaging on Twitter because I do have the NHC director Twitter account. That's a great way to get hold of me if you don't know my phone number or email address. And, um, and I, I, I see social media as an ongoing year-round partnership with us. Because if you say something uh, that is useful, I might retweet that and vice versa. And the more that the public hears and sees information from multiple sources that's consistent. A consistent message really helps. And uh, we really appreciate your help in um, uh, spreading the word through social media channels as well. Uh, we do utilize the NHC Atlantic account as somewhat of an automa automated notification mechanism for telling you when new products and advisories are out. So continue to utilize that. And um, 
I will continue to try to be active on the NHC director account as much as I have time for because I've made the decision long ago that I'm not going to automate it, I'm not going to outsource it, it's only going to be me. So if I'm not tweeting for a while, it's because I'm busy doing other things, but when, when it does come out of that account, it came from me. Uh, and it is a way for us to jointly interact with the public. So, well, thanks so much for the time, for, for listening, uh, for dealing with my tropically challenged voice <laughs> in, the, in this beautiful but cold and dry environment. I, I almost literally evaporated overnight. <laughs> I, I, about 2.30 in the morning, oh my gosh, I had to drink this huge thing of water. But um, That was the humidifier, Rick. Well, I, I, quick, quick. <laughs> well, I'm glad you said that because I want to tell a quick story just to finish. About 10 years ago, I came to Colorado because, you know, every meteorologist's second home is Boulder, Colorado, right? So I came to Boulder, Colorado for a training course, and it was for six weeks, okay? Six weeks in Colorado for a Floridian. And I get into the hotel room, and I go through this problem I had last night for a couple nights. And, you know, every time the, the, uh, the staff would come clean the room, they'd turn the thermostat down, because I like it at 78, right? You know, I'm used, to, I'm used to hot. And so they turned down, and it was really cold, and it was really dry. I said, you know what, I'm going to be here six weeks. I'm going to invest a little bit. So I went out, and I bought a humidifier, and I used it in the room, and I had it like, it, it must have been 79 over 77 in that room <laughs> the whole six weeks. And the, you can imagine the... Uh, the staff come in, they're going, oh, who lives in here? You know, lizard or what? But, so, yeah, I, I, I do, especially when it's on this short turnaround, I do struggle in these dry environments. But thank you so much for having me. And um, this is a great event. Hope those of you listening online have enjoyed it. And uh, there's more to come. Sorry I can't stay, but um, I'll be watching it, online. Thank Thanks. you very much. So um, what we're going to do now is uh, take questions from, from those folks in the room and also questions from those folks watching online. And we understand that we've had some hiccups uh, with the live stream, uh, we, that it is back up. Uh, please ans ask your questions. And we also want you to know that this entire presentation has been digitally recorded and will be posted on the website, the weather, Glenn Gerberg Weather and Climate website, probably uh, end of the day tomorrow, if not uh, first part of Friday. So you'll be able to see Rick's presentation in its entirety. So nothing has been lost uh, from this presentation. So let's uh, go around the room. Again, raise your hand. We'll distribute microphones. We want to make sure that the microphones are available for your questions. Thanks. Thanks, Wayne Higgins, Climate Program Office. Rick, uh, that was a great talk, um, and I really appreciated uh, uh, your highlighting the seasonal um, uh, hurricane outlooks. And as one of the climate guys in the room, um, you know, I just found it exciting to, coming from you, you know, the utility of those, uh, and where we're still challenged with uh, actually interpreting those. Um, and I also really appreciated the, uh, the ways that you're pushing the envelope, you know, out to day five and the new products. So I just simply wanted to sort of comment or highlight where I think there's another major gap um, and would like your impressions. And that is that um, I think that we have tremendous opportunities for actually doing not only monthly updates of seasonal outlooks, but even monthly outlooks themselves. Um, and I would point to the research advances that uh, we've had over the past several years. Uh, including field campaign work like the dynamics of the Mad Julian <coughs> oscillation, uh, and improvements in our operational climate models for actually, you know, capturing the enhanced and suppressed periods in the in the uh, Atlantic Basin, for example. And if you look at last summer, um, you know, it was very very clear, you know, that with all of the dry air coming off of the African subcontinent. Uh, you know, that, you know, in July and August, the Atlantic was going to be shut down. And that was very well captured, actually, in our climate predictions. Mm -hmm. So um, I just want to comment that I think that there really is an opportunity for filling in some of the other gaps on these sub-seasonal time scales that I think would, uh, you would find to be useful, uh, you know, as you push the envelope, you know, beyond out to day five and beyond. Uh, and I think that NOAA has, uh, you know, a considerable amount of information there on these interseasonal timescales that might be also of use to the emergency management community. 
Okay, well, Wayne, thank you for those comments and, and that question. It, it is exciting to think about what the future might look like in terms of what new products and services we could provide uh, in between our five-day forecasts and the seasonal outlook. Uh, you know, any forecast has to be conveyed commensurate with the uncertainty of the forecast at the time it's issued and with heavily in mind the intended audience and the utility of such product or service or warning or whatever it is. Uh, so right now, if I was to think, well, what could we do beyond day five in the next few years uh, following what we've done with our tropical weather outlook? Uh, it would have to convey a little less precision, maybe not be system specific, and paint a broader picture. Uh, and we'd have to have a dialogue with emergency managers and ongoing with our media partners on what are we trying to accomplish with such a product. And there, there may very well be some very useful things uh, that folks need to be doing to plan out uh, you know, a week or two weeks or more. Uh, but do we have the certainty to give them what they really want? And how do we frame that? That would be the challenge. But it's an exciting discussion to continue to have. And we're never going to get from here to there if we don't continue to talk about it starting today. There's no harm in talking about it and, and thinking through what we would need in terms of new tools and, and product development, modeling enhancements, whatever it is, and help from the science community. So lots of excitement, I think, around those. And we have those discussions at the Hurricane Center, trust me, about what uh, we could do in the future. Yes, sir. Uh, Jim White, University of Colorado. Um, this kind of feeds off a question that was uh, posed a little earlier. I, one of the things that we've seen uh, in talking about the climate side of things is a um, sort of a growing um, hostility, probably the best word, um, in the public to the message that, that we're giving among, I mean, you know, a sizable group of people. Um, do, you f do you see that as well on the severe weather side? Uh, do you think there's some underlying issues there? I mean, you know, we all know that the conversations become so polarized that it's, it's actually, you got people who are digging in on one side or the other, it just won't listen. And as a matter of fact, they approach you with, you know, as I said, out and out hostility. Hmm. Do, do you see any of that? Oh, I, I, I see and hear all kinds of different perspectives on issues having to do with uh, what we're doing in the last few hours before landfall all the way out to what's going to happen 100 years from now. Uh, one thing that I do get most concerned about, I don't know if this directly gets at your question, and I'll, and I'll get there, but um, the, the main thing I come across the most that I then spend a lot of time worrying about is that, and I think this is human nature, I think we as humans look for as many pieces of information that will convince us that we don't have a problem that we are posed with. You know, if, and, and it works both ways. It's, it's, it's amazing what we can do with our brains. If, if I was hit by a hurricane last year, I might very well say, well, that was my one hurricane for this time I'm living in this area. I th uh, that, I'm probably good for a while now. And the, and the person next door in another state who hasn't been hit ever in the lifetime that they live there, and they haven't had a hurricane in their community in 100 years, might say, well, it hasn't happened since I lived here, hasn't happened in so long, they just don't happen here. So, and, and everything in between. So we're always looking, I think, for, for reasons to not deal with a particular problem, and that's what makes the hurricane problem so difficult, because it is a pretty rare event at any one location to get a really significant hurricane impact. And that's just one component, I think, of the, the climate discussion as well. I, is there any information there that would lead me as a resident in whatever hurricane-prone community to, to believe that, well, the threat is going to be greater going forward or lesser going forward? Uh, but I, I'll, I'll admit, though, I spend most of my time in, in the period between now and June 1 and, and even beyond as we head to the peak of the hurricane season trying to convince people that no matter what, you got to get ready for this year because with all those factors out there, you might be spinning yourself in circles without really knowing whether or not you're going to get hit this year, and you got to be ready to do that. And that doesn't answer your complete question, but that's where our focus is. That's where I spend most of my time. So just a, a comment. Um, your, your map re reminded me of some maps that were produced probably 20 years ago uh, on the subject of earthquake hazards, and exactly the same result happened that uh, they, they mapped where people lived, where the faults were, 
And then they mm -hmm. ask him, how close do you live to a fault? And, you know, totally wrong. The closer you live to a fault, the more likely you were to say, I don't live near a fault. <laughs> and interestingly, it, it made no difference what education level you had. Mm -hmm. PhDs were just as likely to deny the obvious as people who had, you know, no high school degree. And so there's something inherent in, in you know, human nature about this. And I don't know what it is. You know, social scientists are probably thinking hard about it. But it's, you know, it's deeper than just the hurricanes, obviously. It, it goes to, sure. to all the hazards we have. Sure it is. Yeah. But yeah, and since I'm not a social scientist and I don't have all the answers on how to get the messaging out there in a way that convinces people to do things, but, but one thing that a number of social scientists have convinced me of is that this concept of social norming can be effective. And if you look back to some other past campaigns like the turnaround, don't drown, and what was done with seat belts, and, and there are other things that over time changed from being something that was challenging to convince people about to being more of the social normal perspective. And that's what I'm trying to encourage with the issue of evacuation zones. We can just make it more normal for people to know their evacuation zone. Then you, know, you, get, a, you get a few early adopters on board who really want to know and make it really easy for them. And then you go tell some friends that, well, it was really easy for me to find my evacuation zone on this app or this website or on this TV station. And then maybe some other folks will come along and eventually it'll become more normal. Uh, that's, that's the best approach I can think of at the moment, but I need help doing that. Uh, you mentioned the teams in the National Weather Service that are helping to get these products ready to go. The storm surge and the, um, I think it's just mainly the storm surge watch warning and also the five-day Genesis graphic and things like that. Uh, these teams include social scientists? Well, uh, let's see. The, the, the storm surge warning implementation team that we have within the Weather Service is moving forward based on the social science input that has been received over the last few years that got us to the point about a year ago where we set 2015 as the target for the new storm surge warning. So we're, we're heavily informed by social scientists on what to do uh, in terms of uh, conveying that warning. We're, we're getting more now into the nuts and bolts of how we're going to actually collaborate with the local forecast offices, how we're going to disseminate it. But we still touch base with them, yes. Okay, and I'm curious, do they also include, like, emergency managers, the teams? The, again, the, the, the engagement we had via social scientists uh, that led to our decision to go forward with the warning had social science evaluation of emergency management input, of uh, media input, but because over the next couple of years, we're going to be working toward our first cut at how the warning will be disseminated. There's going to be ongoing discussions with EMs and okay. media folks. And then whenever a product is, product is experimental, like the graphic will be this year, and the warning will officially be in 15, that's also a period to, to have the, the, the back and forth. But we're going to, we have a lot of folks at the Hurricane Center that are going to be fanning out this offseason to, to have direct discussions on all these changes. So okay, the, I, the conversation... <laughs> Goes, yeah, and I guess goes just my on. final question is, are they going to include media partners? Yes. Uh, because, you know, we feel that, that if you're going to make a product, it needs mm -hmm. to be in a form that we can use, obviously, to turn around and inform the public. Absolutely. We'll be interacting with the media. That's why I'm here. That's why the National Hurricane Conference is so important. And that's why we make our way around to other state and regional conferences. So, um, but we should, you know, I don't know what, what you think, Craig, but I know you and, and maybe others here in the room were on this media webinar we did last May that I and Dan Brown and others at the Hurricane Center did. We gotta do more of those, I think, to keep the conversation going. John. Hi, good morning. Uh, John Morales from NBC6 in Miami. You. Uh, can you give us an update on HFIP, the Hurricane Forecast Improvement Program, uh, where that's headed, what progress we've seen, and what, uh, what real outcome we might have from that? And uh, is there anything also from the Sandy Supplemental Funding that might impact our ability to uh, uh, forecast intensity especially of uh, cyclones. Okay, great questions, John. Thank you. So let's start with HFIP, Hurricane Forecast Improvement Program. We're, you know, roughly speaking, halfway through this 10-year program, multi-million dollar effort. Um, it is, it has been and is continuing to fund a number of things. One of the things that HFIP has funded is the new Hurricane Wharf or Weather Research and Forecast Model, one of the Operational Weather Service Hurricane Models that model was upgraded last year using a lot of HFIP support. And some of the, uh, the runs of that model on a number of past uh, events 
utilizing aircraft data in new ways, data assimilation, where you, you'd make the most of all the data, bring it into the inner core and do a better intensity forecast. There is some reason to be hopeful on how that model is going to perform in this year and subsequent years on tropical storms and hurricanes. We just didn't have a whole lot of systems affecting the U.S. to run it on, didn't have a whole lot of hurricanes to run it on this year um, in the Atlantic. Uh, but there is reason to believe that it's going to perform noticeably better than its predecessor on not just track, but there's, there's a little cracking of the nut on intensity. You know, it's not going to solve the problem overnight, but it, it is a good sign. HFIP has supported that. HFIP supported some of these social science interactions, this HFIP socioeconomic team that I joined when I was in the media and that I continue to work with Weather Service Headquarters folks on. It's funding ongoing social science evaluation of all kinds of new products that we are envisioning that I didn't have time to show you today. Uh, it is, it's funding a couple new contractors at the Hurricane Center this year. It's continuing the work of contractors we have at the Hurricane Center, working a lot on modeling. So, uh, the, you know, when HFIP is all said and done in a few years, uh, hopefully we'll be able to look back and say, okay, it has led to whatever reduction in errors, but we're, we don't know that yet. Um, the other question you had was Sandy Supplemental. Uh, that has largely funded some pretty significant supercomputer upgrades in D.C., which allow us to run these more advanced hurricane models and a lot of other models, and Sandy Supplemental is helping us get this across the finish line. So, yeah, it's helping a lot, too. Brad. Brad Panovich, NBC Charlotte. Um, this, this is kind of a conflicted question. I'm probably setting myself up for an answer here. But um, the seasonal outlooks, I think you guys talked about it. Well, as the meteorologist side of me loves these that we're continuing to try to do mm -hmm. seasonal forecasts. But from a broadcaster standpoint, I'm curious what your thoughts are on what value they have to the public because uh, what we're seeing is, you know, we, these forecasts come out preseason to a lot of press release hubbub, um, every station, AP. Um, we build it up as an active season, and then we have something like this year where they don't impact the United States. Do we leave the public with the sense of, okay, there was supposed to be an active season, and we didn't get hit. Um, do you think there's a way we could communicate the seasonal forecast better? Maybe we do the <coughs> monthly updates and give them as much <laughs> publicity as the early season um, update? And um, what value do you see those to the public in general? Okay, there are two main values I see to the seasonal forecast. One, it is a very uh, worthwhile scientific endeavor. If we don't start from where we are now, uh, how are we ever, you know, decades from now going to be able to forecast landfalls farther in advance and, and do the things Wayne was talking about? I mean, it's got to be part of the scientific endeavor. and. You know, last year was not a good year for the seasonal forecast overall accuracy, but they've had some good years in the past in getting the overall numbers right. There's, there's science there, some very good science there, and there has in many years been some forecast skill there. But again, the utility for the, for the citizen and the business owner isn't there. Uh, but the other big utility of the seasonal forecast is it is an on-ramp to get the conversation started back on the preparedness piece because if... Um, I mean, now, now I, I, would, I would like to think that we could partner in ways with things like the Hurricane Awareness Tour that I hope to re rejuvenate, uh, that events like that can get the conversation going just as well, if not better. But we need every little bit of help we can to get people thinking about hurricane season. And that's what happens, uh, for better or worse, <laughs> using a seasonal forecast. Maybe there are better ways to get that conversation started. But it does do that. But I know that once the seasonal forecasts from NOAA and from other entities go out, you don't hear me spending a lot of time going into the details of how that seasonal forecast was put together and what the numbers mean, because they don't mean much for anybody, uh, because you know, the numbers themselves don't. Because, as the example showed, you can have a below average season and get hammered with a major hurricane. And you can have an above average season and nothing happens locally where you live. So, we, we have to very quickly, once those numbers come out, refocus everyone's attention on what they should be doing to prepare and that they can be hit this year no matter what the seasonal forecast says. Uh, but I, it, it, it's, it seems very unlikely to me with the number of entities that are disseminating seasonal forecasts that they're going to go away anytime soon and that people are going to stop talking about them. So I think the best thing to do is to encourage the science to proceed and to 
you know, get on the coattails of the media attention that the seasonal forecast gets to, to get these other preparedness messages out there. Yeah, I agree. I, I, that's kind of my feeling, too. I think it's more of a messaging thing than anything. Yeah. It's how, you know, how, how is the information presented? Um, but and the converse is when it's a below normal forecast, <laughs> we've got to go in the other direction. Yes. Exactly. That, yeah. that, is, that is a significant challenge and concern because one of these years, we're going to have another year like 1992, yeah. and we got the forecast right ahead of time, and there was a Cat 5 hitting somebody. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, uh, we got the messaging right before that. Yeah. Well, that's hit. just the opportunity when it's a below normal forecast is to point out the Andrew year and say, yes. look, this is still, yes. it doesn't mean that there's not going to be a problem somewhere potentially. Right. I agree. A below average forecast should always be followed by here's what happened in 92. Yep. Right. right. So, uh, my name's Ned Gardner. I work with the Climate Program Office, and I produce a video package for the Hurricane Outlook every year. And, um, I've, this has been very informative a number of times through this conference. What we've come back to is this need for more common sense among the public around understanding weather and climate phenomena, and certainly tornadoes. We went in depth into a lot of examples. And what this is kind of shifting my thinking toward is maybe focusing. We love to talk about the science that goes into the forecast and the climate science that goes into the forecast because we're really invested in that, but shifting emphasis maybe towards coastal vulnerability and our building patterns and just basic common <coughs> sense messages, which I know that the hurricane forecasters are always trying to bring us back to anyway. Mm -hmm. And I think this kind of feedback is helpful. So I know I didn't add anything to what you said. I just wanted to keep that conversation going. And Thank you. I think it's an important point. Okay. Rick Howard Bernstein, WSA in Washington. The false alarm issue, and I know that's something you guys don't want to do, and I know you take a lot of good consideration when you say these areas should evacuate, yet they're coming from the local areas too. You know, trying to get people who have evacuated once or twice and spent time, spent money, and the storm went that way, the storm went this way. Um, it, it's tough to counteract that. You were, you were talking about the folks who don't know whether how close they are to the fault zone. So all of these things, is just an uphill battle. So please keep doing what you're doing. I think all of these new products are great. And, and one thing, and I was doing this, you, the evacuation zone issue that you were talking about earlier, I just did a quick search. There seems to be no clearinghouse. Everything was done at the local county level. Mm -hmm. And I hope our uh, weather service friends who are in the building, uh, in the room at the moment, and you guys will further this and come up with some sort of, you know, whether it be a national site or something that just conglomerates mm. all of this so that people can, evacuationzone.org or whatever it may be, or gov, just come up with something and hopefully sooner than later because it has to be easy. And when you make it easier for Joe Sixpack to know where they are in that zone, it's going to be easier to get the message across and easier for them to know how they need to react given certain situations. Completely agree. We, we've had some of those conversations already with some of our emergency management partners. Uh, I've talked with Brian Kuhn, the, the, the director of the state of Florida the Division of Emergency Management. Um, I've talked with uh, Leslie Chapman Henderson from Federal Alliance for Safe Homes about that. I've talked with a number of state and local emergency managers elsewhere. You think this would fall under FEMA? FEMA, I think, would be uh, a big part of the equation here uh, because they provide all kinds of tools and resources to the state and local emergency managers. Uh, and it really is something that the, the, the emergency managers at those state and local levels need to decide what they want to do, what they want to be on board with, because it does vary from state to state, city to city, how evacuation zones, if they have them, are, are, are named, how they are communicated, how they're utilized in real time. So, so there's, no, there's no standard? <laughs> no, not nationally, no, there's not. Um, and th that's a discussion that's starting, too. But um, we meet regularly in the off-season with federal, state, and local emergency managers. And that conversation is going to come up at one of those annual meetings next month. So, but we, you know, we, we do have to do the right thing because the emergency managers have very carefully crafted plans on how to use those evacuation zones and it differs from place to place. But uh, again, no matter what they do, I, I want to advocate for it being easy for the public to find out that information. And a clearinghouse is the way to go, I agree. Uh, Matt Safino, KGW, Portland, Oregon. Um, obviously, tropical, not a real issue for us, but we do have uh, evacuation. Stop laughing, Dale. <laughs> this is valuable information I'm about to provide you with, pal. Um, 
we do have an issue with tsunami evacuation mm -hmm. routes and planning. And you use the word clearinghouse, and the website I just pulled up is a, from the, a state agency in Oregon. It's the Oregon Tsunami Clearinghouse uh, website that lists all. It's got an evacuation zone map viewer and all of that. So that's what's being done for something that's even less frequent than, than tropical storm evacuation routes. But uh, it, they do issue these evacuation zone maps and the inundation maps. Uh, on a regular basis, they keep filling in the places that they haven't done yet. So that's how it's being handled uh, for tsunamis on the West Coast, at least in Oregon. Yeah, thank you for that. And I've even talked to some international folks who are knowledgeable on tsunami in other parts of the world. And I, I, apparently, there, there are a couple places around the world where they draw a line on the ground. This is how far the tsunami could get. <laughs> and it's, it's as clear as day where the zone is and where the zone isn't. Um, but as you, can, as you can imagine, and maybe you've heard, if you look at different parts of the U.S., in some places, locally, they've taken some pretty publicly visible steps to try to delineate the hurricane evacuation zones. In some places, that's been well received. In some places, not so much. So you go to Tybee Island, Georgia, they got a poll out there telling you how deep the water could get and what, what zone you're in, what category and all that. Um, and in, um, in Charlotte County, Florida, Wayne Saladay, emergency manager down there, has wrapped bands around uh, stop signs. You know, so, but it's different from place to place how that is approached and received. Dave. Okay, Rick, uh, we have a couple of minutes left in the session, and I wanted to turn over the microphone to Sarah Maxwell, our social media producer, because we've gotten a lot of online questions. We're not going to be able to get to them all, uh, but we will be able to post this video back online, and certainly they can ask those questions uh, through the Twitter account as well if we don't get to you. So, Sarah? Hi, Dr. Nab. Um, this one is related to what you were just talking about. Uh, is there evacuation zone data available um, in certain software or applications for handheld devices uh, that would be useful to some people, some of the public? Um, and if so, which ones do you recommend or would you uh, promote? I think it varies from, again, from state to state, locality to locality. Some uh, some places, the, the, the state emergency management website is the best location to, to start. So if you live in the state of South Carolina, for example, you'd want to go to the South Carolina Emergency Management Division and see what, what they have to say about evacuation zones and storm surge, and that will probably help you drill down to the local level. And other states uh, have some apps. It, it varies. So uh, I would start on the web and do a web search uh, for your state, emergency management evacuation zone, and, and, and start from there. Uh, but you'll find a, a variety of web resources and uh, app resources, depending on where you live. Okay, thank you. Um, and the next question I have is, um, what's your short answer to those who claim that some signific the significance of the recent lack of major U.S. landfall hurricanes, and is there anything specific that you would attribute that to? Year-to-year -year variability. If you look at hurricane history going back 100 years or more, there are periods where uh, the U.S. or parts of the U.S. were getting hammered year after year. And then you can go for years without your area or the country uh, being impacted. It's not new for hurricane activity to go up and down in terms of cycles, in terms of overall activity and landfalls. So it, just because last year was quiet for the U.S. certainly doesn't mean that this year will be. <laughs> um, persistent. It showed up in the yearly summary. If you look, it just came out from NCDC, the cooler than average from the plains into the southeast. Mm -hmm. I think the la at least this year, in addition to the dry, there was just a small window to get something into the U.S. because there, there was a general trough position along the kind of the Mississippi Valley, Mid-South, that kind of thing, which I think also might have attributed to some of that, but sure, as yeah, there yeah. is variability. Yeah, obviously. sure. If, if we're, yeah, I, I was Synoptic taking, matters, I was taking yeah. a, a much broader historical approach to the answer, but in terms of the physical reasons for why this year, yeah. uh, why 2013 behaved the way it did, yeah, tho those are valid uh, issues to bring up. But I, I guess I was going back to my usual approach of, of telling folks that, uh, that this has happened before, where it's been really busy, really quiet, really busy, really quiet. So just to continue that conversation, because this can become pretty interesting if we talk about it. Um, now, th th 30, se <laughs> 30 seconds. This is John Morales, John Morales from NBC6 Miami. Um, so, so that pattern just described with the trough either along the east coast of the U.S. or the far western Atlantic, North Atlantic, 
has been pretty persistent over recent years. And now, while this is not settled science, and we've had presentations here at this particular conference from Dr. Jennifer Francis and, uh, and others that have presented uh, the possibility of a uh, wavier jet stream as uh, the climate changes, and uh, the persistence of a ridge uh, in the more central Atlantic extending up, extending up towards Greenland with a trough in the far western Atlantic and the southeast U.S. So we wonder out loud mm -hmm. if uh, this might so uh, be a more persistent <laughs> pattern, uh, maybe not permanent, but uh, the propensity for that pattern might be there in the future. Right. Uh, excellent questions, and I, I've, I've seen uh, reports or read journal articles that are going after these issues, but it, it's only, you, know, you look back not all that long ago to 2005 where we had that persistent ridge in just the wrong place opposite to what you just described uh, that sent everything right into the, into the southeastern U.S. I, I just don't think we have a long enough history of the changes in hurricane activity to be able to accurately predict what's going to happen in the future, but I would not be shocked if things are a little different <laughs> going forward than they've been in the past. I mean, the, 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 you know, there are changes to our climate system that are easy to see that have been going on uh, with the increase in temperatures, increase in CO2, and uh, I would not be surprised uh, if we saw changes, but I don't know if we have a very good ability to predict accurately what those changes are going to be. If we can't predict in May what the upcoming season is going to be very accurately, you can imagine how difficult it's going to be to predict a multi-year uh, pattern of activity. Wayne. Yeah, Rick, Wayne Higgins, Climate Program Office. Um, so I just want to comment that in addition to the year-to-year -year vari variability, if you look at the historical record, there are uh, decadal variations. Oh, absolutely. And, absolutely. and in particular, if you look pre- and post-satellite era, because, of course, we didn't see every swirl out over the Atlantic prior to the satellite era, but uh, since that time, we have a better un understanding of the activity. Uh, there has been, um, with this variability that you described, an increasing trend in, uh, in overall net intensity uh, mm -hmm. on a seasonal basis. And I actually, tomorrow, in, as part of my talk, will show the evidence for that. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, in, in, in my previous answer, I'm referring mostly to landfalls because <laughs> you can have uh, even busy overall years and not get a landfall impact. And then, you know, as, I, as we've talked about, it, uh, even a blow average year and you get an impact. So from one year to the next, what we get in terms of land impacts can vary dramatically, but absolutely we've seen decadal cycles in overall hurricane activity. The challenge, though, is that even though we've had satellites for a few decades, but our hurricane record is not all that long in terms of having the accuracy anywhere near uh, what it does today. So it is, it is somewhat of a challenge looking back really far, 100 years or more, to figure out what the trends have been over that period of time because the, the data availability and quality have changed so much. So I would love to, to sit and, uh, and talk through all those nuances. It's, it's a scientific challenge and it's interesting, but it also makes it challenging to figure out what's going to happen going forward in terms of numbers and intensities of storms. Okay. Yeah, one more. Uh, this will be our last online question, but I wondered, uh, they were wondering if you would touch a little bit on what's being done maybe in the research area um, to improve the accuracy of hurricane intensity forecasts. Okay, well, the hurricane intensity forecast problem has largely been addressed by what John asked about earlier, the Hurricane Forecast Improvement Program, because there are two major things, well, three, three major components to attacking that problem. One is having more and better observations in the core of a hurricane. And we have the Hurricane Hunter planes uh, with the Doppler capability on the NOAA planes. Uh, that data is being utilized better than it has in the past with these new enhanced models developed through the Hurricane Forecast Improvement Program. And you need the computing power, which the Sandy Supplemental has helped us to do. So observations, utilizing them well in advanced models and having the computer power to run those models are the ways we are trying to advance the intensity forecast problem it's going to be one of those things we chip away at. It's, we're not going to solve the problem overnight or between now and next year, but that's where we're going to make our progress. Rick, thank you very much. Please offer uh, Rick another round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dave. This is terrific. It. Thank you so much. Sure. And uh, for the online viewers, thank you so much for sticking with us when we had some of our hiccups uh, with the stream. What we're going to do now is take a look outside. We have this thing called the sun. I don't know what it was, it was called. It's actually a uh, sun. It's su sunny outside. Take a look at this live shot in Breckenridge, Colorado. You can see the trees moving, so there's a bit of a breeze, but it's a gorgeous, gorgeous shot outside. 
right now. What we're going to do is we're going to take a break. Uh, Rick uh, Nab has to be interviewed by a couple of the, the media that are here in the room, so uh, he has a limited amount of time for that. And for the online viewers, uh, please know that we're going to take a few minutes to reset all of our production equipment just to make sure uh, we, we fixed and reset the routers uh, out in Breckenridge. And so we're just going to make sure that all of our production equipment is also reset. So there'll be a period of black. Uh, we won't be uh, uh, broadcasting any uh, agendas or anything like that uh, that we normally do. But as soon as the equipment gets reset, we'll bring all that back up and start with Dan Bailey. So we'll take about a 15-minute break. Uh, we'll be back here at about 20 minutes, between 20 and 25 minutes, uh, or 15 and 25 minutes after the hour. So just uh, stay tuned, and thank you so much.